Hey there, Dango Stu here. In today's video, we're gonna be taking a look at outboard forward controls. This forward control has been lying around the workshop for ages, and I'm not so much gonna do a repair on it, it's just pull it completely apart, sort of show you what's inside, the sorts of things that can go wrong. Because it's been lying around for a while, I just noticed then that it rattles quite a bit and quite a lot of mud's coming out of it. So I'd say it's had uh, wasps building nests inside it. So we'll take it apart and clean. Those of you who've been watching the channel for a while might notice we're back in the old workshop under my house, uh, just because it's the weekend and I can't be bothered going into work. Um, I figure it's kind of fun from a you know, nostalgic point of view anyway. This forward control is from a Honda outboard. Uh, I don't think these forward controls have their own model numbers the way the Yamaha ones do. So I think they might be reasonably generic. These three holes you can see here are where the bolts go through to mount the forward control in the boat. So they're just empty at the moment. And on the back here, you'll see there's always a set of uh, Phillips head screws. In this case, there's two screws here that hold on this cover plate and this, you can just remove this section here if ever you're changing the cables. You don't need to open the back here at all, the top half. So we'll start by taking this bottom half off and I'll show you how these control cables attach to the forward control. There's certainly nothing scary under this bottom plate other than perhaps the uh, wasps I'm expecting to see. In here, along with a lot of mud, you'll see from this end is where the wiring loom comes in. Then you've got your two control cables here. There's a bit of metal here that they slot into. All these universal control cables have a little groove here. Some outboards, like the Mercury, have a larger kind of rubber plug that goes on the control cable, but this is quite a common, common setup amongst lots of brands. So this particular groove will drop in to this bit of metal and that means that the outer casing has a fixed position and that's what allows it to extend the inner section relative without it all sort of flopping around. How the cables attach here varies slightly from outboard to outboard. In this case we'll start by pulling these off. We've just got these little R clips. One for the gear and one for the throttle. And then once they're off, it's really easy just to lift these up. Sometimes there's washers on top. There appears to be washers on the bottom here. And then these will now just come out of this particular piece of metal. Sometimes this metal is quite loose and you can pull that out. So make sure you don't lose that. But that's where they slot in. In this case, we've got a washer underneath each one. Quite often you'll actually also have a washer on top and then the R clip goes on top of that. So just make sure you don't lose those either. While I'm here, I'm just gonna have a quick look at these cables by simply just pushing the ends. So that one moves quite nicely, and so does that one. So these actually seem to be in pretty good nick. I can't see any problems with the cables themselves. Before I put them back in, I probably would use that sort of compressed air method to put some oil through them, because they do feel a little bit dry, but they're certainly not seized. When you buy a set of universal cables, they just come with threaded ends. So if you're swapping them over, you need to hang on to all these connections at both ends. In this case, this particular model of Honda has one like that at the forward control end. And then it has a little 90 degree piece like that that screws on at the outboard end. But that varies a lot from outboard to outboard. As well as the main loom coming out of here that goes to the outboard itself, there's also a few connectors here that are designed to go under the dash to drive things like your um, gauges and to give you power when the ignition's on only, that kind of stuff. Okay, so four screws now to take the top part of the cover off. Maybe five. Now we've got those five screws off, I'm gonna take the two screws here that hold the fast idle lever on. screws and lever and then we can start lifting this cover off.
All right, I'll show you what we've got inside here now. We'll start going through things now in no particular order. Uh, first thing I want to say is that if you're trying to figure out which is your throttle and which is your gear, your gear is always the one that just clicks. Then as you progress, the gear doesn't move anymore. It's stiff, but your throttle will continue to progress. So this one's obviously throttle, and this one here, clicking back, is gear. On the top here, where we had our fast idle, I'll just pop this back quickly. Now we've got the cover off. These do vary slightly from model to model. In the case of Yamaha outboards, this fast idle comes off with the back cover, so it actually makes it a little bit trickier to sort of get the mechanism all lined up again when you drop the back cover back on. But if we lift this fast idle, we've just got a really direct mechanism to move the throttle cable here. You can see here it's also got a return spring for the fast idle. So once you get up to a high speed, it sort of locks past a cam, but once you drop it a little bit, it'll help it return. So we'll take this off again and we'll start removing a few more bits and get deeper into this section. There's a single Phillips head here that holds the fast idle mounting on. There's also a little circlip in here. So we'll just pry that circlip off, or an E-clip I think it's actually called. A washer on top. Now I'm just going to hook this spring off from this side. When you lift the fast idle, this is a little detent. There's another spring inside here. Let me take this off and I'll show you. So this spring here pushes this little detent cylinder against the body of this. I've just put this handle on backwards so it doesn't cover this area. But what you can see is as you move this handle, it goes from one position where that detent cylinder is locked into a groove, then it pushes back against the spring until it drops into the next position. So that's kind of what locks the fast idle in its completely off or completely on sort of setting on this particular outboard anyway. If the fast idle wasn't staying in position, I'd be suspecting this spring's failed, this detent's popped out, whatever. But they're the parts that are going to be responsible for that not staying. I'll take this section off in a second, but hopefully you can see there's a little detent cylinder, smaller but similar principle to the other one, just sitting in here. And this is what gives you that sort of decisive click into neutral. So if I move it away, this little cylinder pushes out. And when it gets to neutral, this little cylinder here can push back in. There's a little matching half here. And that, when the fast idle is off, that little slot here gives that detent something to retract into so that you can go into forward or reverse. If you activate the fast idle, that little detent's not pushing as the groove it's against here. So what that means is when you go to push the forward control, it's trying to push the detent away, it can't, and that's what stops you coming out of neutral when you've got the fast idle on. So if you've got a problem where you can't get into forward or reverse, it could be because there's a fault with that mechanism. If you can go into forward or reverse, even with your fast idle up, then it means that's probably missing because that's the kind of the safety mechanism as well as that sort of decisive click when you go into neutral. There's a 10 millimeter nut in the center here, so let's undo that. Next thing I'm gonna take this E-clip off here as well. And you see here they're called E-clips because they've got these three sort of points that grip around the shaft they hold onto. If you shift this section forward, you can actually get a shot at an Allen key underneath here that holds this bracket on. So I'm gonna undo that Allen key and then we can lift the whole thing off. 
I think you've got some chance of being able to wriggle this out without doing that, but given I can get a go at it, I'll just take it apart in one hit. So if we take that fastener, which is the Allen key one that we got out from underneath, let's say we can separate this easily. So it looks like you almost do have to slot this in first, get it in, put it together the way we, the opposite of what we took it apart. So this part of the forward control sort of does the magic of allowing you to push the throttle forward, select forward gear and give yourself more throttle, as well as pull the lever back, select reverse and give yourself more throttle. And it's really a sequence of channels and little sort of lobes like this that go into the channels that sort of guides it all. These units are pretty robust. It's pretty solid metal. You'd have to use a lot of force to break it if it was seized. But what you will find is there's a lot of these little sort of nylon bushings that go around a lot of the metal parts. And if these wear out, they can have sort of a loose connection. You can lose alignment and it can start jamming up. So if you do a sort of an overhaul of one of these units, one of the things you'll probably be doing is replacing those little nylon bushings. One day I'm gonna sit down and actually figure out how these things work. I've never really got my head around how this mechanism allows you to push the throttle forward or backwards and always push the throttle in the same direction. It's kind of clever, but just never really sit down and thought about it. With these parts, other than replacing these nylon sections if they're worn, for me, really, it would be a case of cleaning all this grit out now because this one's so dirty and then just re-greasing it. There's not much else you can do to them. The trick to putting these things together is you'll see you've got a lot of moving parts. So this bottom one was our gear selector. And if you see here, there's a little notch here. And then on the bottom of here, there's a little protrusion that goes into that. So really, it's about getting everything lined up so it can drop down. If this is a little bit out, it's going to sit on top of there, but it's not until it's perfectly lined up that it will drop down. So it's really about getting everything in its exact orientation before you start pressing it together. Otherwise you sort of put it in, it's not dropping down, you put the case on, it's sitting 10 mil up. It's because things aren't perfectly aligned to allow them all to slot in. There's a couple more sections that I guess we'd call the mechanical side of things before we go into the electrical side. If we come to the front of the control panel again, we'll see here there's a little notch just here and this is where this lever goes through so this came off because we unbolted from this side but where this comes through when I lift this lever up it pulls that white plastic part out of this groove here which is what allows you to change gears so if you find that you can't move this sometimes it's because that bit's broken and it's just resting in there and it's catching that kind of thing this outboard obviously didn't have trim tilt from the forward control, so there's no switches here. Otherwise, you'd actually have wires running down here as well to run the trim tilt. The final part of this forward control that is mechanical is a little screw here, which is often labeled friction or whatever. And what this does is as we wind it here, you'll see it in here. There's a nut. And as we wind it, it extends out. And it's pushing this plastic brake here. And that will push against the metal mechanism we had here and just apply a bit of extra friction so it's a little bit stiffer and the controls will stay where you put them. This quite often uh, on other brands is up here and it's adjusted from the front, but very similar idea. All right, so I'll bring you in close again now and we'll go through the electrical side. Here were our indicator lights. These are all connected with these little bullet connectors, so I'm just gonna pull these ones off now. If this light wasn't working, you could swap this out. You could try cleaning these connectors, that kind of stuff. 
when it comes to putting one of these units together again, this is the part that I find often if you've sort of taken it apart and it's not particularly neatly arranged here, this has actually got cable ties and all the connections, it can be quite cramped here. It can be quite hard to get all these connectors and wires back in and get the top on without it sort of, you know, spilling everywhere. So it's always a bit of a challenge. In this case though, I'm actually gonna undo this cable tie. And we'll get these connectors out. So here we've got our uh, sort of overboard switch, the, you know, the shutter lanyard. Take the key out of this one. So that's what you'd normally have around your wrist in case you fall overboard. Then it's just got a bit of a plastic hex nut here. So we'll take that off, push this through. These don't last forever, so it's another good thing to know that you can just jump in here and replace if you need to. And then here just two, two bullet connectors. Someone practicing saxophone in the distance. It's like being on The Simpsons. When you put your lanyard in, it stops current flowing. And then when it closes, current flows again. And it's actually an earth. It's what turns the motor off is by earthing the ignition and stopping the current building up and going to the spark plugs. Similar idea on this side, which is our ignition switch, which is a bit more complicated in that we have ignition off ignition on, then a momentary cranking of the starter motor. So there's a few more connectors for this one. So if you need to change the ignition barrel. Now, if you lose a key, you'll see on this one, hopefully, here, there's a little three-digit number, and you can use that three-digit number to order a new key for this. I'll probably do that because I actually don't have a key for this forward control. So I can use that number to go and get a new one. So the last thing attached to the loom is the warning buzzer. So there's our warning buzzer. If that wasn't working, once again, just really nice, simple plug-in replacements. So you can order one of these, swap it out. And then after that, we've got the loom. So it's a couple of plugs like that at the outboard end then a whole lot of bullet connectors at the forward control end. This also gives you a better view of this uh, friction mechanism. This section lifts off too. One thing I'm not seeing in here, because it probably happens at the outboard end, is a starting gear protection switch. So that's simply a switch that says, when I'm in gear, anything other than neutral, don't let the starter motor be turned over. Sometimes you'll find that happens with a switch that looks very much like this little detent. It's just a little switch. Um, it sits in a groove. It allows it to work. As soon as you push the lever, it pushes out of the groove, disconnects it so you can't start it. So you'll often see that inside a forward control as well. So that's pretty much everything inside one of these. Um, the things you can have is trim tilt switches and wires uh, and the, the start and gear protection, that's it. Getting it back together is not really rocket science. It all sort of goes back together pretty much the opposite way, but you do have a lot of pieces that interact. So you need to make sure they're all aligned properly in order to drop down. If you find you're putting it on and it's sort of sitting up, try just giving it a little rotate. Also sort of try and get a sense of where everything is. Photos are great. Get a sense of where everything is when it's in neutral. Have put your lever in neutral, all your parts as though you're in neutral and sort of build it back up put your cables on last. When it comes to putting that final lid on, particularly I find with the Yamaha ones, you know, sometimes you might need to get your, whatever I did with it, oh, here we go, your fast idle lever, and just give it a little bit of a jiggle. You know, you're just trying to get things, so they might be a fraction of a millimeter out, and by just wriggling the lever, wriggling the fast idle, whilst you put a little bit of pressure on the lid, or the back plate, you might find that you can just get things to drop in and go down. The other one is just having wires caught. Don't force it, because if you've got wires caught, you're likely to cut them, cause a short, all that kind of thing. If you get stuck with something like this as well, 
I highly recommend looking at parts diagrams, schematics for them. Schematics are great if you sort of look at it and you go, oh, hang on, I can't quite remember where something went. Jump on a parts ordering site, look at a schematic, figure out how it's supposed to go, copy that diagram. They're a really good source of information for pieces of an outboard that have lots of complicated parts that interact with each other. You know, little questions. If you're wondering, did the washer go on the top or the bottom? A parts diagram will help you answer that question straight away. It's probably not fair to say these four controls are simple. They're really not in the sense that they're not rocket science, don't get me wrong, but there are quite a lot of bits that interact and they're all packed into quite a small space. And in some ways that can make them a little bit challenging to work with. If you're looking at taking your, changing the cables on your boat, just take the bottom plate off. There's a, a reason they're two separate plates and that's so that you don't have to just risk bits going everywhere. Down the track, I would like to do a video on each different brand of these. There aren't that many, and even though there's lots of outboard models, they do often share a forward control. So it's not that, you know, sort of onerous to think we can go through them all and, and show the basic principles of them all. All right, well, thanks for watching. Next week, we'll be back in the workshop where I'm going to change all the oil seals in the Evinrude 150. Those parts have arrived and we'll get the boat back up during the week. So we'll push on and then we'll be getting pretty close to the end of that project. All right, we'll take care and I'll see you soon. Bye.